We all have events in our lives that cause us to wake up and realize that maybe it's time to change our lives. For my next guest, it took a car crash. Christine, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, you really are <laughs> really am. glad to be here. So it was June 25th, 2006, yeah. car crash. You were drinking and driving. I was, yeah. And ended up in a morphine-induced coma. Yes. Take me back to that day. Oof. Well, I don't remember yeah. four hours prior to the accident. Um, like I said, like you said, I was in a coma uh, for about five days afterwards. I hit my head so hard almost bled out at the scene. They used the jaws of life to get me out of the vehicle. Mm. I was drinking and driving. I wasn't paying attention to the road, but obviously I was so drunk or I hit my head so hard that I, I don't have a real memory of what led up to that moment. Mm. Um, I was airlifted uh, to Sunnybrook Hospital and uh, the nurses and doctors, you know, and God did a miracle on me. Wow. Yeah. Take me back to what, who Christine was on June 24th. Oh, 2006. my goodness. Well, um, I was a restorative hygienist, mm -hmm. and I, you know, was making great money. Mm -hmm. I thought I ha had arrived, mm -hmm. you know. I, I had a great job, great friends, an amazing family, um, but I always knew that something just wasn't right. You did know. I knew. I knew. Like, there was always those times where it's like, I have all of this, but why am I still sad? Mm -hmm. With my alone time, why am I still... You know, why am I still sad? So, yeah. So what did you, what did you do to kind of calm that sadness? I drank. I drank and I drank and I partied with my friends. I did drugs. I, you know, and I thought that that was fulfilling and I thought that that was just me partying, but it was really just me trying to fill, mm. you know, so that I wouldn't be alone and I wouldn't be sad. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm reading this list here. So injuries, <laughs> shattered hip, yes. lacerated liver. Yeah brain injury, yes. collapsed lungs, broken leg, you are sitting in this hospital yeah. bed. Yeah. I mean, you're just broken. Yes. Internally yeah. as well as externally. Yeah. But yeah. your sister. Yeah, bless her. Oh my goodness. Is kind of this angel <laughs> in this story. Yeah, she really is. She uh, she came to my bedside. Uh, she didn't leave my bedside. She was uh, she she worked in Burlington, would travel all the way to Sunnybrook Hospital just to be with me every single night to pray with me. And I didn't believe in God at the time, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I I remember uh, when I finally kind of came to and I was out of the coma and I was starting to, things were starting to make sense and they had told me, you know, this is kind of what happened. You know, I, I wouldn't want to go back to sleep because when I was in the coma, it was, it was terrifying. Mm. It was like, I remember everything mm. from that coma and it was just like a horrible nightmare. So I didn't want to go back to sleep. So she would come and she would pray with me and she started reading to me a book called Captivating by Stacey El Eldridge yeah. and it was through that and through her prayers and the Christian music that she gave to me that I found peace and then I started to really really question like who is God mm -hmm. you know how come he loves me like this book says he loves me why were you all of a sudden open to that conversation well I think that it was you know I'd I'd had I'd lost everything at that mm -hmm. point you know I thought I had everything mm -hmm. and it was all taken from me in one moment. And so, yeah, like it was, I had no choice in that moment but to question those things. It's interesting because you were talking about this lifestyle where you were circulating with your friends. Yeah. yeah. And then I noticed in the story that your sister was there. Where were your friends? Um, I've, you know what, I think two of them came to visit me in the hospital um, and that was short lived. Mm. You know, uh, they just kind of disappeared. You know, one visited me at home, but I mean, we're talking months, like two months in the hospital, yeah. months and months of recovery after that. It, the, the full recovery took almost four years. Wow. I had a surgery three years later. Like it was just, you know, it was a lot of recuperation and the friends that I had, you know, as wonderful as I thought that they were. And, you know, I'm not saying they're not good people because yeah. they are, but um, they just didn't have the stamina to stay with me. Mm. You know, so I bless them. <laughs> so what was happening in your heart towards Jesus? And how did you start to see that change? Yeah, my sister kept talking to me about um, like her C group girls, like her connect girls. Yeah. And I was bedridden. Like my, I actually got moved from Sunnybrook to my parents' home and they set up their whole living room there for me. And in that, 
um, she would always come and she would, you know, wash my hair, do my nails, whatever I need, because I was bedridden. And I was just like, I needed to get out of the house so bad. Yeah. <laughs> and like, she kept talking about these wonderful girls and I was just like, I'll go. Yeah. Like, I don't know who they are, but I'll go. And uh, yeah, and it was through that, you know, like, like I found out that, you know, the, the moment the car accident happened, this entire church was praying for me. Mm -hmm. You know, these C group girls, they were all praying for me. So when I walked through the door of this woman's house, it was like, oh my goodness, Christine. You're the walking yeah, miracle. Well, you're the miracle. We've yeah. been praying for you. Same thing when I entered the church. Yeah. The whole church came up and gave me a hug. But you weren't totally sold. I mean, you no. tried Jesus out for a while <laughs> just to see. Yeah, you know, I was really, um, I was really skeptical um, in the coma because it was terrifying. I remember uh, praying, um, ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff would comfort me. And I remembered that because that was taught to me when I was a young child. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't something that stuck with me, you know, but it came back in the exact moment that I needed it. And so I knew that there was something to that. And so I kind of made a promise in that, you know, like, God, if you're, if you can save me from this horrifying place, can, I will come and find you. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that promise when I got out of the coma. Mm -hmm. And so my sister started coming and, you know, and then I met all these, these C group girls and I'm like, oh, I have to do this because I made a promise. <laughs> <laughs> so I did and I started and I kept with it. And finally, like I started going to C group, then I started going to church and I would just weep in worship. Like I, I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't know it was God that was speaking to me in that time, you know? Uh, and so finally, about six months later, I listened to a, um, I'm an artist, so I'm very visual and, uh, Affabel, Okay. It, it's an audio play. Okay. And so you have to sit and, and close your eyes and just listen to it. And a bunch of C group girls were doing this at their house one evening. And through that, after that, um, they do the sinner's prayer. Wow. And I was just bawling by that time. And I gave my heart to God wow. in that moment. And then I gave my heart at church publicly the following Sunday. And now yeah. you uh, do visual arts ministry as well. Who does or what does Jesus mean to you today? Oh my goodness, everything. Everything. What does that mean, everything? He is, he is, he's my salvation. Mm. Like everything that I've, oh, I'll tear, everything that I've been through, mm. you know, um, I almost died. You know, my life could have been so much different. If I hadn't have died in that moment, you know, I would have been in a gutter easily somewhere. Mm. He is the one that picked me up and saved me, mm. you know. Um, before the car accident happened, I was so drunk and driving, and I remember crying out and saying, oh God, like if you're real, just fix me. I don't know what's wrong. Mm. And that was one of those prayers that I didn't realize just what was gonna happen. Yeah. You know, and a week later the crash happened. And so I see all of these things when you look back and all of it lines up, mm. you know, and it's just such a story, yeah. you know, and God was in every single moment of it. He's always been there with me. And all I had to do was cry out. Mm. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Christine, for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I hope uh, what Christine said to us today resonates with you. Maybe you feel broken. Maybe you feel like, God, what is this life worth living? Why am I living this life? I want to remind you that he is the author and the finisher of your life, that he orders your steps, that he loves you so desperately. And like anybody that loves somebody, they want to have that reciprocated. They want to have that love felt back. But, you know, I love Jesus because he's not going to force himself on you, but he's there waiting for you to say, yes, I will love you too. And so I want to encourage you today that if you um, need to call the prayer lines, they're always available, 1-866-273-4444, or you can email prayer at crossroads.ca. And just a great reminder that we have amazing prayer partners that love you because Jesus does, that they care about you, that they volunteer their time desperately so that people will learn to love him, Jesus, as well. Stay with us. We'll be right back.